We've now got most of the crucial ingredients for modeling human syntactic processing and language comprehension. That is, how we, in real time, identify the meaningful and structured relationships between words in a sentence, how the words combine into phrases, phrases combine into larger phrases, and ultimately into sentences, along which meaning composition occurs and we're able to understand what we hear and read. Those ingredients include statistics of the linguistic environment, which we can estimate as researchers from samples of the kinds of data that humans are exposed to every day, a focus on predictive incremental processing. Humans don't take in large swaths of text and then start to do analysis in their minds. We're actively and aggressively analyzing and incorporating each little bit of input moment by moment as we get it through our eyes and reading or through our ears and listening or eyes and signed language, reconciling that input with the preceding context, updating the context and moving on. And third, we have a formalized model of this predictive processing based on the kinds of statistics that exist in the environment. We looked at the incremental probabilistic early parsing algorithm, which is an eager algorithm. It actively incorporates all available information in any particular moment. And the one more ingredient that we're going to need now to actually link a theory like this to observable behavior is going to be a relationship between properties of a formalized model and things that we can observe in the environment. And um, we're going to use, we're going to return to the idea of word surprisal as a crucial part of that linking relationship. So to remind you, surprisal is the log of the inverse of the conditional probability of a word in its context. In the special case of isolated sentence reading, where we present a sentence to somebody in isolation, as we often do in psycholinguistic experiments for convenience, the context might be just the preceding words in the sentence. But more generally, all sorts of information might be relevant, and the theory would, would predict that are used, that those kinds of information are used. Things like the larger discourse context, knowledge of your interlocutor, the visual environment, and so forth. Now, surprisal captures a very basic idea about not just language processing, but processing by uh, intelligent agents more, more generally, which is that the more we expect an event, the easier it is to process. Active prediction and expectation forming can actually facilitate um, operation in your environment. Brains are prediction engines, and uh, there, there's a reasonable hypothesis that this is actually a strong evolutionary constraint on the processing of input and, the and, and preparation for action in all sorts of um, behaviors by intelligent organisms. In language, um, we don't have to try very hard to do prediction. In fact, it's hard not to. So to re-exemplify this, we've seen other kinds of examples, but I'll just remind you of this, um, this ubiquity of expectation formation in language processing by just giving you the beginning of a sentence and you'll find that um, a word uh, as a plausible next word comes to your mind. Hold on to it and I'll try to guess it. Here we go. So if the context is my brother came inside too, um, chat might be a continuation, wash might be a continuation, get warm might be a continuation, but this is a very, um, a very highly uh, diverse uh, possibility context. Many, many different continuations can come out, so it's not that likely that I guessed correctly with any of these. But if I give you the context, the children went outside too, a lot of interesting things happen. First of all, I can guess the next word um, with high probability you thought play, but not only that, you knew that I could guess the next word. So you not only have a very strong expectation for the next word in this context, but you actually have sort of awareness of that strong expectation, expectation that others would share it, and so forth. It's quite a remarkable testimony to the richness of human cognition as brought out by language, but more generally than language as well. Um, and we've seen before that predictable words are read faster and have distinctive EEG responses. So now this next step that we're going to do is hook up the idea of surprisal with probabilistic grammars that we just saw to give grammatical expectations. And it's the probabilistic early algorithm that's the underlying machinery that's going to give you those prob grammatical expectations, but it's computed on probabilities of a grammar. So to remind you, the surprisal graph looks like this. A probability one event carries zero bits of surprisal, zero bits of information. Um, it might as well not happen, but it has to happen. And as probability decreases towards zero, surprisal, surprisal increases asymptotically towards infinity. A zero probability event is infinitely surprising, but fortunately it never happens. So we're now going to take this um, and look at uh, a case of local syntactic ambiguity. You've seen local syntactic ambiguities before, but uh, we haven't covered this one in any detail. So uh, I'll just first give you the sentence, read it, reflect on it for a moment, and I'll read it with neutral intonation. When the dog scratched the vet and his new assistant removed the muzzle. 
So take a moment to reflect on that. You can pause the video if you want and think about, um, for most people, if you haven't seen the sentence before or a sentence like it, this is going to be a very confusing sentence and you have various uh, kinds of inferences um, that will arise. Some of you may feel that the sentence sort of fell off a cliff, it didn't end. Some of you may feel that um, that there was a particular point that it was uh, it was weird at. And just reflect for you, when did the sentence be begin to become weird? So for many of you, it will be at this word removed. Okay, um, And the reason that it, it happens so frequently that removed is a confusing word at this, con at this point is well describable by the grammatical properties of the sentence. In particular, um, the preceding part of the sentence, the dog scratched the vet and his new assistant, would be a great clause. That would be, in a grammatical sense, it would be a something of the category s. Okay, but that interpretation is not compatible with the next word being a verb because of the grammatical properties of English. English requires, in general, um, a subject before a verb. And so if this thing is a clause in and of itself, if we imagine putting an S category above it, then the next thing that should happen before the verb is actually the beginning of another, the main clause. Okay, and so we should have some kind of subject. We don't get a subject. Now, the reason that this is an okay sentence, it's actually a perfectly grammatical sentence of English, is actually that that, original, that interpretation of the dog scratched the vet and his new assistant as a clause is actually not right. In fact, the vet and his new assistant removed the muzzle is a clause in this sentence. And the dog scratched is a subordinate clause that ends at the word scratched. So this, in a general way, has sort of the, um, the characteristic, which we'll call, um, we'll give the syntactic analysis S bar, which is um, often used here. And that, in turn, gives rise to a sentence of this form. So the main sentence is composed of an initial subordinate clause, when the dog scratched, and then a main clause, the, dog, the vet and his new assistant removed the muzzle. But that's not apparent to the incremental comprehender. This is one more illustration of the incrementality of language processing. When you read, you're effectively doing syntactic analysis as if you did not yet have the word removed. And before you see the word removed, there's no reason to think that the vet and his new assistant is not the object of scratched, and hence part of the subordinate clause. And what it turns out is that the reanalysis of this sentence to change into this other syntactic configuration is very difficult and surprising. And in, in the old days, um, this is a classic experiment from almost 40 years ago now, Fraser and Rayner, 82. And in those days, they used um, the difficulty measure in an eye tracking experiment of milliseconds spent reading the word the first time you look at it per character. And actually, that's a really nice measure for a lot of reasons. but. Um, we won't dwell on that here for now. Um, the main point here is that this was 68 milliseconds per character, and we can compare this with a control condition, where, for example, you have a comma after the word scratched. Intonationally, this would be when the dog scratched, the vet and his new assistant removed the muzzle, and now removed is much easier. Alternatively, we might have the phrase its owner um, before the vet. And now scratched has as its object the, its, its owner, and so it's much less appealing to make the vet and his new assistant part of the subordinate clause because scratched doesn't doesn't have a place for an object anymore. You might be able to shoehorn the vet and his new assistant into being part of a larger object phrase with its owner, but it scratched is no longer calling out for an object after you get its owner in the way it was in the first version of the sentence. So for example, in the Fraser and Rayner experiment here, um, what you see is that, uh, is that the, its owner sort of blocks this subordinate clause interpretation where the subordinate clause wouldn't end until assistant and as a result, when you look at the reading time on this word, it's, it's faster. So this is 50 milliseconds per character, so substantially faster. Now, how do we model this? So what I've done here for pedagogical purposes is just written a simple PCFG for the sentence type. And you can look at this analysis in the 2013 book chapter um, that uh, I refer to in the syllabus. Um, the, uh, the anal this PCFG is a, it's a toy model in the sense that the probabilities are not real probabilities from a corpus. And this is only a very small fragment of the language. But this highlights a few useful and important properties of English that are relevant for understanding this example. One is that, for, so that um, sentences can start with subordinate clauses, S bars, and subordinate clauses usually have commas at the end, but they don't always. Okay, and that's actually an empirical fact about English. Verb phrases, of course, can be transitive. They might have a noun phrase after the verb, or they might not. They could be intransitive. 
just a verb. And Scratch, note that it can behave both ways. And of course, noun phrases can have coordinations or not, and they can have adjectives and so forth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, take this grammar and then turn the Bayesian crank that the probabilistic early algorithm gives us. And under the scenes, behind the scenes here, I'm doing a little bit of analysis of how much probability mass is on these um, different possible incremental trees. Uh, and we're not going to go through those details. I just want to show you the outcome. Um, so there's a garden path analysis here um, that we'll uh, that, that I'm illustrating here, where the garden path analysis has the property that the vet and his new assistant is the object of scratched. That's what the syntactic tree illustrates. And with that analysis, we can ask what's the probability of that analysis given the, these words. And it turns out under this grammar, this this probability is fairly high. It's 0.826. There's another analysis, which is actually the ultimately correct analysis, where the vet and his new assistant is not the object of scratch, but actually the subordinate clause ended at this point after scratched, and the vet and his new assistant is the subject of the main clause, and we haven't yet seen the verb of that main clause. This tree structure has a relatively low posterior probability given these words, just 0.174. Now, within surprisal theory, how do we say, how do we talk about whether the word scratched is surprising or is, is hard or not? Well, we have to compute the surprisal of the word given the context. Now, when you have multiple trees, we're going to need to marginalize the actual underlying syntactic analysis, syntactic tree, before you get to that word scratched in order to determine its probability given the preceding words. Because surprisal says what matters is the probability of the word given the preceding context. In order to get that through a grammatical model, you have to marginalize out the trees. And so ultimately what this boils down to is how likely, how well, is each of these analyses able to predict that removed might be the next word. And you'll notice that the upper uh, analysis is in, it's not able to do that because before it gets to the main verb, it has to have a noun phrase subject for the main clause. You have to get to the subject of the main clause before you get to the verb. So the preferred analysis is unable to predict the word remove. It's only the dispreferred analysis that's able to predict the word removed. And um, it turns out that this has the property that um, will that that the disambiguating verb is intrinsically going to be surprising in this case relative to what it would be in other situations. And the reason is that um, is that when you look at the marginal probability of the word and the role of the incremental trees, that you're oh, that you're weighting the likelihood that each incremental tree, each analysis, would give to the next word being removed by the posterior probability of that analysis given the preceding words in the context. And what you have is a situation where the preferred analysis is unable to give you removed as the next word. Only the dispreferred analysis can. And so you're multiplying a zero by most of the probability mass, and then you're taking the non-zero number and multiplying it by a relatively small conditional probability of that analysis given the preceding context. And that's going to give you a, a fair amount of surprise. And how does this manifest? We can compare this example to the minimal pair from the original experiment where its owner exists in uh, the subordinate clause as the object of scratched. So this is the NP present version. And the former thing that we saw on the previous slide was the NP absent version. And when we look at the surprisal of the word removed at this verb, we see that not having its owner in the context increases the surprise of y 2.2 bits. Okay. Now, that's one phenomenon. There's actually an interesting second order phenomenon in the same or overall configuration. And this is due to a more recent experiment by Staub, 2007. And this is a superficially similar looking example, once again with in neutral intonation. When the dog arrived, the vet and his new assistant removed the muzzle. Now, you probably, in contrast to the preceding example that we looked at, have a different experience with this sentence. So empirically, once again in eye tracking studies, um, we find that removed is easier actually um, that in this case when the verb is arrived than in the original version when the verb was, it was scratched. But actually there's another thing that happens, which is that the that also people seem to slow down a little bit at hitting the word the vet, at hitting the word the uh, followed by the vet. And um, once again, we're going to compare this with the scratched version of the sentence. So relative to the scratched version of the sentence, the arrived version of the sentence is harder at the vet, easier at removed. Why would that be the case? Intuitively, it's because 
Scratch does set up an expectation for the ver for getting a, a noun phrase object after it, and arrived does not because arrived is usually used as an intransitive verb, whereas Scratch is, is very often used as a transitive verb. And so um, that is not a disambiguation effect in the same sense, but what happens is that Scratch predicts a phrase of the form the something here and makes it easier to process relative to the verb arrived. But then you pay later on because the way that Scratch predicts that is through assumption of a syntactic relationship that the vet is the vet is a new system is the object of Scratched that ultimately turns out to be wrong. This is sometimes known in psycholinguistics as pay now or pay later. With the arrived version, you're sort of paying now for getting a surprise at the, ver at, at, uh, the vet, but you ultimately wind up in a correct analysis, so this is easier. Whereas scratched makes you pay later. You don't pay here because you actually predicted the right kind of phrase, but you predicted it in the wrong way, and so you get surprised here. So let's see how this works. So actually this probabilistic grammar is not going to be able to capture this more detailed pattern with a scratch derived distinction. And the reason is because syntactic categories in a probabilistic grammar involve they impose conditional independence assumptions. In particular, the outside of a syntactic category is independent of what the inside of a syntactic or category in a probabilistic context for grammar conditioned on the label of the category. So the rewrite, and, and one way to think about that is that if I have a V category in my sentence, in my tree, then which verb it turns out to be cannot be dependent on the outside context because the probabilistic grammar doesn't know anything in terms of the probability assignment except that the left-hand side of the rule is v. Okay. However, we can refine our grammar. So there are mechanisms for relaxing. You can think of that as a probabilistic locality assumption. And you can relax that probabilistic locality assumption in probabilistic context for grammars by enriching the category representations. So this is an example of how we would do that. We would take this piece of the grammar and we would split it up. We would introduce a distinction between, we'll call them transitive verb categories and intransitive verb categories. This is actually reminiscent of how we would deal with, for example, capturing subject verb agreement properties in a non-probabilistic grammar. Okay, and it's a similar kind of move. That is, we, in, in, the, we increase the amount of information in the category representation. So here we have a transitive verb category and an intransitive verb category. And transitive verbs are usually used with an object after them. Intransitive verbs are usually used without an object after them. We're going to make all these things non-categorical since this is probabilistic models. And then um, arrived is intransitive and uh, scratched and removed are transitive. So that's just one change which is motivated by a simple kind of knowledge that a language user would have, which is basically what kind of usage does this verb have? Is it used transitively or is it used intransitively? And uh, the grammar just then re, uh, recapitulates that piece, piece of knowledge and encodes it in the appropriate way. So let's see what the effect is in terms of surprisals. So let's take the arrived versus scratch versions and we're going to look at two points here. We're going to look at this ambiguity onset when the vet, this new, the beginning of this new noun phrase could be inside the subordinate clause as an object or it could be inside the main clause and outside of the subordinate clause as a subject. And then the other thing we're going to look at is the ambiguity resolution position. And what we see is that at the ambiguity onset, the scratched version is less surprising. The, uh, the arrived version is uh, almost two bits more surprising than the scratched version. But, and this is once again, there's no, there's no difference other than the verb category, uh, the, ver the verb identity. At the ambiguity resolution point, what we have is that the scratched version is now substantially more surprising than the arrived version. And um, this is once again because in the scratched version, you are actually preferentially treating the vet and his new assistant as the subordinate clause, and that makes um, hitting a verb before seeing a main clause subject surprising. And so actually this one very simply motivated adjustment to the probabilistic grammar actually captures both of these effects that occur. And um, these were, are empirically observed uh, phenomena in human language processing in terms of reading times. Now, this is a pedagogical toy grammar. So we also want to ask the question, well, does this scale up? 
And so what I'm going to show you next is using the entire pen tree bank, um, the brown section of the pen tree bank, and using basically nothing, um, nothing more than the simple category representations that are in that, in that uh, corpus, except that I'm going to introduce the transitivity in transitivity distinction that I just described by looking at whether a verb usually appears in some, uh, with an object or rarely appears with an object. And if I do that, now we have like 12,000 rules. This is a very rich broad coverage grammar and it can parse, parse all sorts of other things. And we'll use the very simplest possible estimation technique for, um, for the rule probabilities. We'll just use relative frequency estimation, that is maximum likelihood. Um, and what we see is that now um, we're going to, I want to draw your attention to these two areas. One is the ambiguity onset and the other is the ambiguity, um, is the, is the ambiguity resolution. And I'm just going to look at the difference in surprisal between the arrived and scratched versions. And I'm going to look at the difference in first pass times and eye movements. And um, so negative numbers here are going to be an advantage for the transitive, um, uh, for the transitive version that is faster times in transitive than in, uh, than in transitive and positive numbers will be the reversed. Faster times for intransitive than for transitives. And then what we see now is that at the ambiguity onset, both the surprisals and the reading times favor the scratched version, the transitive verb version. And the opposite pattern arises at the ambiguity resolution. Both of these, um, both the surprisals and the reading times favor greater ease for the intransitive arrived version. Okay, and so this is, a, this is the end of this vignette on applying probabilistic grammars, incremental parsing and surprisal to analyzing one kind of syntactic ambiguity processing effect, in particular garden path ambiguity resolution. But we saw several important lessons here. One was that um, that you uh, that different kinds of information sources can be introduced in a fairly rich way inside probabilistic context-free grammars by clever use of category representations. Another thing that we saw is that w you can introduce a, um, a piece of knowledge in a simple principled motivated way and it can have cascading effects in processing at multiple parts of the sentence both immediately after the verb and much further downstream um, and we also saw that we get um, not only sort of good good qualitative fits to the um, to the uh, to the to behaviors in human processing but also actually these things will scale up gracefully as we go to much larger rule sets um, with naturalistic corpora where we can have broad coverage parsing.